In addition to my two colleagues, which are here with me today, um, Dr. Carice Hutchinson and Mr. Matthew Kearney, I'd also like to acknowledge the work and input of Tom Cotter on the Gulf tourism side and Dr. Carla Bulle on the film uh, tourism side. So, um, tourism is doing very well in Northern Ireland at the present time. Um, in a way we could only have dreamed of um, 20 or 30 years ago. So momentum at the moment is, is huge and potential um, is even greater. But if we're to grow as a truly successful tourism destination, particularly in a sustainable way for the future, we have to prioritize those forms of tourism that on the one hand we can best provide and on the other hand that bring a significant economic impact, a significant return in terms of visitor span. So, two of those particular forms of tourism that we're ideally suited to provide in Northern Ireland at the present time is golf tourism and film tourism, two highly lucrative forms of tourism, two emerging forms of tourism on a global basis. But we need to think much more strategically about these two forms of tourism and plan much more effectively um, to harness those. These forms of tourism have not been developed and exploited to anywhere near their full potential as yet. We need to get much more serious um, about that. So, um, to start with golf tourism, there's tremendous potential at the present time. You may have heard as recently as yesterday that, for example, Sergio Garcia, Ernie Els, um, Ricky Fowler, uh, and even Lee Westwood are now coming to this year's Irish Open at RCD. And in fact, we're awaiting news this afternoon that Darren Clark may be announced as uh, the next Ryder Cup captain as well. So we're getting huge media attention globally in relation to the profile of our top golfers, the events that we're hosting. Um, and we have, as we know, some of the top golf courses in the world, but we still haven't leveraged the maximum potential um, in relation to that. To put some global context on it from an economic perspective, golf tourism has been valued at some 20 billion US dollars with over 50 million golf tourists traveling the world to play in some of the estimated 32,000 courses. So that's phenomenally significant in economic terms. And we're ideally suited here in Northern Ireland to get a much larger slice of that um, right here and capture a much bigger percentage of what the rest of the world have been enjoying as far as this particular form of tourism is concerned. Golf primarily particularly just in case there are any non-golfers here, is primarily played on two distinctly different types of courses, parkland or lynx courses. The majority of the world's 32,000 courses are parkland courses. In fact, there are deemed to be only 246 true lynx courses in the entire world. So just 1% of all those golf courses are true lynx courses. Why is that important? Well, golf tourists, particularly North Americans, but golf tourists in general, predominantly prefer to play Lynx courses. It's the original form of golf, where golf began, uh, was on Lynx courses at St. Andrews. And we're ideally situated again with respect to that. So Ireland, for example, has 58 Lynx courses, 24% of the global total. Here in Northern Ireland, we have 14, 6% of the global total. So that, again, is phenomenal for such a small country to have such a high percentage in global terms of those Lynx courses. And we don't make enough of that. That's a hugely important selling point that we simply don't make enough of. In terms of the characteristics which influence golf tourists in terms of their choice of destination, a number of important factors there. I'm just going to highlight the ones that we really need to concentrate on uh, here in Northern Ireland. Um, weather and climate is a huge influencer for golf tourists. That's not ideal here in Northern Ireland, but we can't do anything about it. We can't change our climate, so let's forget about that one. We can't change our location. We have no control over that, so we don't need to worry too much about that one. We don't need to be concerned about the quality of our courses. We have some of the top ranked golf courses in the world, so that's fine. Number of courses we don't have much control over either, although I will mention later uh, the travesty of allowing the recent Bushmills Dunes project to potentially not happen now. Um, but generally we can't do much about the number of courses in our regions. So the ones that we need to concentrate on are price, resort and hotel reputation, other tourist attractions in the area, shopping 
in the area, because a huge proportion of visitor spend in relation to Gulf tourists is on retail. And Gulf tourists are a very lucrative form of tourists. They typically spend two to three times more than other forms of tourists. And they like their spa facilities as well. And we need to make sure that we have enough of the right quality spa facilities in Northern Ireland and around Northern Ireland to cater to that market and not just have them all based in the greater Belfast area, for example. So in relation to some of our recent research on these issues, we uh, were interested in golf tour operator generated business too, or Lick's golf courses in particular, to determine the economic value of that. Questionnaire research was conducted with golf tour operators, 76 operators across 19 different countries. Questionnaire research was conducted with Oliver Link's courses here and interviews with a number of golf club secretary managers and club professionals. In addition, uh, we conducted a golf event economic impact study in and around the Irish Open 2012 at Royal Port Rush. Uh, that consisted of observational research during the tournament itself, content analysis of social media during the event, and questionnaire research conducted with 30 retail-focused SMEs from the North Coast region post-event. So what did we find uh, from that research? Well, total Northern Ireland revenue from Lynx Gulf tourists, those coming through Gulf tour operator, generated business was just under nine million pounds per year, significantly higher than was previously estimated. But very interestingly, 5% of Northern Ireland golf clubs produce 64% of that revenue. So food for thought in relation to that. 75% of these golf tourists are golfing purists, 16% are golf and activity seekers, and just over 8% are corporate clients. So there's great scope to, to develop and expand those latter two uh, types there. Average group size, just over seven people, spending just over seven trip nights and playing six courses in that period. So they come here to play golf. They don't come here just to play one course. They come here to sample a range of courses on any one particular trip. Over 80% go for four and five star accommodation. So as we said before, they're, they're high spenders. It's a lucrative market. They're looking for quality, high star accommodation. Just over 67% are from the US, 19% Canadian, or just under 7% European, uh, just over 6% Middle East, Asian, and Australasian combined. So clearly there's scope to grow some of those other markets there and not be too overly dependent on the North American market. Particularly that's important for Asia. The Asian market is now by far the largest in terms of global television viewing figures for golf. If you take the, the Irish Open at 2012 in Port Rush, there was an audience of 403 million people watched the event around the world. The largest percentage of viewers were in Asia, followed by North America. The busiest month of the year for these golf tourists coming through golf tour operators is September, which sees it over a quarter of all the Gulf tourist arrivals, followed by May. So we do have a, an issue there in terms of spreading the numbers and the spend over a period of time. In relation to your findings with regard to the Irish Open 2012 in Port Rush, um, the immediate economic impact wasn't capitalized on. We've heard a lot about success from the Irish Open 2012 in Port Rush, hugely successful tournament record spectator numbers, fantastic media coverage, and so on. The economic impact for the North Coast area wasn't that great. A huge slice of potential earnings were lost by traders. So what we were looking at then was, why did that happen? What were the key, the key issues? Well, the first thing was the traders were largely to blame themselves in many cases. Opening hours were a total fiasco. So for example, as you can see down towards the bottom there, and I'll mention that in a moment, there was issues with visitors not being allowed off the course once they'd entered. But the reality is, if you're there to see the golf, you're there to see the golf. So most people, regardless of that, are not coming off the course till after 6 p.m. Most of the shops in the surrounding towns, including Port Rush, pulled down their shutters at 5 or 6 p.m. So we didn't have an evening economy that we need to have when these huge scale events are on. So a lot of potential spend was lost that way. There was also a lack of business know-how, not understanding the market. 
thinking that these people would want to buy what the typical tourist wants to buy, which is not necessarily the case. So some understanding of the market is required and also not fully embracing the event. So for example, when these kinds of events are on, everyone working in the area is an ambassador for golf tourism. So if a, a tourist comes in to, to you and you're working in a petrol station or a news agent and they say, what time is Rory teeing off at today? You have to be able to tell them. You can't say I'm not interested, um, which is all too often what happens, sadly. We did have issues with visitors not being allowed off the course once they'd entered. That's been changed for the tournament RCD in May, so that won't be an issue anymore. And we had a park and ride scheme taking people away straight after play was over. Now, that worked very well. It was very efficient. From a transport and logistics point of view, it was great. But what you were doing was taking a lot of people straight out of the area, uh, and which then meant they couldn't spend any money uh, in the area. So there are issues over that as well. Just to summarize on that, uh, golf tourists coming here are a very high spend form of tourist. Lynx golf appears to be undervalued in terms of its economic contribution. There is an over-reliance on the North American market. And our access routes is a highly significant factor in future growth potential for any form of tourism, but particularly for golf. Even our main market, North America, is not particularly well served in terms of our access direct to Northern Ireland at the moment, never mind the other markets that we want to uh, develop. So Stormont certainly needs to look at air route development and take it much more seriously uh, in that regard. We have capacity issues in the month of September. We need to spread the business much more throughout the year. The lack of a purpose-built golf resort, the loss of the Bushmills Dunes project, is extremely detrimental, as that looks like that may not happen now. That shouldn't have been allowed to falter. That was very remiss of uh, organisations and, and government bodies in Northern Ireland not to allow that to happen. That would have given us a unique selling point for golf in the world. It would have given us six championship links courses within the one 30-mile stretch of coastline. Nowhere else in the world can provide that. But that sadly looks like it may not happen. And to maximise event success, we need to learn from mistakes made at the 2012 Irish Open, particularly for this year at Royal County Down, for 2017 in Loch Erne, and much more so when the actual Open Championship returns to Port Rush as early as 2019. We have to make sure that we maximise the impact that that can have. I'll return to some of those issues briefly at the end. Moving on, and I should have said actually at the beginning, Originally, these were two separate submissions, and we were asked to put them together into one, which is trying to, to balance the two here. So moving on to film tourism uh, potential in Northern Ireland, and as you've already partly heard today, our creative industries here in Northern Ireland are doing incredibly well at the present time, and certainly one which has had a very high profile in terms of how it's doing is film and television production here. In terms of economic impact, we look at the UK, first of all. Uh, UK film contributes over £4.6 billion pounds to UK GDP and supports over 117,000 jobs. But films depicting the UK are responsible for generating a, around a tenth of overseas tourism revenues, estimating that around £2.1 billion pounds of visitor spend a year is attributable to UK film. So in other words, of all tourism revenue in the UK each year, around 2.1 billion pounds of that is due to the influence and impact of film and the impact that has on our tourists. Moving the focus then to here in Northern Ireland, um, things have been happening here, changing a lot in recent years. We've seen huge developments, new productions um, and so on, just to highlight some of the, the great successes. Uh, game of Thrones has, of course, been the real game changer in terms of the profile that it's given us in many ways that way. Um, and it has created huge opportunities, not just for film production, film and television production itself, but as I'll come to the, the tourism potential and spin-off um, from that. But we need to recognise and not just focus it on that one particular high-profile example. So other recent successes include The Fall, it's recently finished its second season, um, and that's been a hugely successful television series produced here in Northern Ireland. 
as well. And we've had success with feature films too, quite a number. Just give an example of one there, the recent uh, Dracula Untold movie, uh, again, which was filmed here in Northern Ireland. So we've had huge successes that way, but Game of Thrones in particular has sort of highlighted um, things that way. I mean, who would have thought if we'd said 10 years ago that the most popular television show in the world would be made right here in Northern Ireland? And again, arguably, we're still not quite making enough of that, particularly from a tourism perspective. So economic impact of, of film in Northern Ireland benefited from direct production spending of 121 million between 2009 and 2014. However, the potential tourism impact um, is much greater and has yet received very little serious attention so far, with some Game of Thrones initiatives aside being the one main uh, exception to that. So in terms of research in relation to this, uh, I've been researching film tourism for over 10 years now, but in relation to recent research uh, with my colleagues here, we conducted netnography with the Game of Thrones fan base on a global basis. So essentially, we delved into engaging in dialogue and discussion across a number of key online uh, platforms and forums with the Game of Thrones fan base. Essentially, we wanted to find out what makes the Game of Thrones fan tick in a sense. Uh, and interviews were also conducted with representatives from HBO, Tourism Ireland, and various stakeholders involved in Game of Thrones based activities and experiences. Two key ones there being Clear Sky Adventures at Castle Ward uh, and Macomb's Coach Tours. So, in relation to key findings there, the Game of Thrones tourist we have found is passionate and demanding in terms of what they seek, uh, in terms of tourism experience. They are escapists. They're searching for an immersive experience that captures some authenticity of Westeros, its characters and storylines, as well as the scenery, the sets, the costumes, and even the food. And quite significantly, they want a themed activity-based experience, and they're willing to pay for it. So they don't want to come here and just necessarily look at the scenery where the scenes have been filmed. That is significantly important, but it has to go much further than that. These people are very passionate, they live and breathe the show, and they want to come here and enjoy some authenticity in relation to the show. In a sense, they want to live out various aspects of the show. And those are the kinds of experiences we have to look at offering this new breed of tourist. We've also found that the awareness level that Northern Ireland is the main location is growing amongst the Game of Thrones fan base. That was an issue in the earlier years, earlier seasons of the show, that the awareness levels weren't quite there. Not enough people were telling them it was Northern Ireland that they were seeing. We've also seen elements of a creative entrepreneurial spirit to cater to these film tourists as well, through some of the examples that I mentioned, but a bit too slowly to leverage maximum potential. We've pockets of good practice. I mentioned Clear Sky Adventures at Castle Ward which featured as Winterfell in the show. They've been very successful with their Game of Thrones archery experience. They now do Game of Thrones themed medieval barbecues and other kinds of Game of Thrones aspects where you can actually get immersed in certain respects, dress up in the costumes, conduct mock uh, sword fights and so on. And, and likewise, Macomb's coach tours with their Game of Thrones tours, which have won a number of awards recently actually for what they provide in that respect. So we've seen elements of that, but not yet enough to, to fully capitalize on it. And despite the HBO endorsed Northern Ireland marketing campaign that was launched by Tourism Ireland last year, which was fantastic to see, um, promotional efforts overall in relation to film tourism in Northern Ireland have still been lacking. And we need to see much more of that. We need to step that up much further. So um, in conclusion, we do need a coherent and focused film tourism strategy for Northern Ireland. That's urgently required. Opportunities to capitalize on the tourism potential of film and television successes here are being missed. So we've had fundamentally great, uh, very high profile successes here, uh, thanks in no small part to organizations like Northern Ireland Screen. We haven't yet seen enough evidence from our tourism bodies the likes of NITB or Tourism Ireland, or sorry, Tourism Northern Ireland is now, now rebranding to, in terms of taking that forward and really leveraging the maximum tourism potential. It needs to be more proactive rather than, than reactive. 
And likewise, we need a focused strategy uh, in relation to golf tourism in Northern Ireland. I'm aware that one is being uh, put together at the present time, uh, but it needs to be much more effective than our previous golf tourism strategy, which was in 2005, and reads like it could have been written by my eight-year-old niece. So we need a, a proper, decent, strategic document that addresses the key fundamental issues, many of which have been outlined here today. If we do that properly for both of these forms of tourism, then we have a very, a very bright future uh, for tourism in Northern Ireland. Okay, thank you.